morning. Thank you, praise team, and welcome everyone to worship this morning at Zor United Methodist Church. Um, and to those of you who are online worshiping with us as well. It's another beautiful day here in the Centerville community. And um, we're grateful and blessed by the beautiful sunshine and the weather that I think is a little chilly this morning, but it's going to be warming up soon. Were you here yesterday for the community-wide yard sale? It was a great success. Thank you. Uh, we have a holiday craft show coming up as well. Want to learn how to make crafts and sell them? Miss Kathleen and Miss Catherine will be downstairs today hosting an open house to show off some of the items you can learn how to make. And you can be, we all would like to be a little bit more crafty. I think that's a great idea. And it's not too early to be thinking of things for Christmas. Um, let's see, I've, I've got some handwritten notes here. Susan, please, uh, okay. <laughs> Ask Kathleen, Catherine, and Cameron to stand up. Okay. At the, with the crafts that Catherine and Kathleen are teaching us about, I want to let you know that Adora at the piano made this lovely outfit that Cameron is wearing by learning sewing and crafts. going on at Zor, lots of news, community bulletin, lots of events. Please sign up for the things that interest you on the tear-off portion of your bulletin. Um, on the other side of that slip of paper, write down your name, any prayer requests you may have so that we can be in prayer for you and your loved ones. Please list any praise reports you might have as well so we can celebrate those. Make sure you drop off this tear-off portion in the uh, offering plate as it comes around later in the service. And again, good morning and welcome. several participants. Steve will be talking to us about UMCOR, and you'll really want to pay attention to that. There is a lot of stuff going on in this world today, unfortunately. And UMCOR is there to help. Uh, they do need our support. Susan McKenzie is our lay reader. Now, maybe I should be a little bit nervous today because I have an Alabama lady with a black belt in Taekwondo sitting right behind me during my sermon, me being a Georgia guy. Well, I just don't know about this. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, but maybe it'll be okay. <laughs> I, I, I trust you. Last but not least, we have our wonderful praise team, and uh, they always add such a level of excitement to our services. I really appreciate them. And I will be different. So that's going to be a little bit different. Uh, okay. Okay. So we want to be begin with our congregational hymn number 384. And if you could please stand for that. Thank you.
may be seated. If you would turn in your hymnals to number 766, which is our responsive reading of the day. Psalm 32, found on page 766 of your hymnal. We'll begin with a response, and then I will read the lines that are not bolded, and you will read the ones that are bolded. And all together, we will begin with the response. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Shout for joy, you upright in heart. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed are those. When I did not declare my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave the guilt of my sin. Be Be glad glad in the Lord and rejoice. rejoice. Shout for joy, you upright in heart. Therefore, let those who are godly offer prayer for you, to you. At a time of distress, the rush of great water shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You encompass me with deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like an unruly horse or a mule without understanding whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle. Many are the pangs of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Shout for joy, you upright in heart. And now for our scripture reading. You can find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. If you would go to that in your pew Bible, it's also in the New Testament, page 181. And I will be reading from the Revised Standard version of the Bible, and this Bible is a real treasure to me. It was given to me by my home church when I started third grade, by my um, home church, Home Street United Methodist Church in Huntsville, Alabama. So it's more than a couple of years old, this Bible. All right, if you will, uh, are there, we will hear the word of the scripture. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once regarded Christ from a human point of view, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from Christ, from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, for our sake, he made him to be, to be sin, who knew, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now we will welcome Steve Campbell, who will speak to us about the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR. Thank you, Steve. Hello, everybody. 
why do bad things happen to good people? That's an age-old question that God's people have, have always pondered. The Bible doesn't give us any pat answer, but it does give us some direction in how we respond to that. The book of Job, particularly, is, is devoted to this topic. And, and I'm not quoting Job here, but in it, God says to Satan, uh, I guess they were just sitting around one day, um, and God says, just look at my man Job. There's nobody like him on earth. He's blameless and upright, a man who loves God and despises evil. Satan kind of bows up at that, and, and, he, and, he, and he challenges God. He says, Oh, he, he's, he just loves you because you protect him and, and, and you make him prosper. Well, Satan decides he's going to test this. And God doesn't stop him. Why? We don't know. But you know how the story goes. All kind of bad things happen to Job. He loses everything. His family, his possessions. He loses it all. And he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand why this has happened to him. He prays fervently to God. But the calamities continue. His buddies all, all say, well, you must have done something. You've offended God somehow. And Job says, no, no, I, I don't know why this is happening. But, and here's the key, Job continues to have faith in God. He trusts God. He says, I don't understand this. I don't know why this is happening. But I know that it's not your will for me. And in the end, you know, Job is restored. His faith not waver. In Psalm, Psalm 57 says in part, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. Jesus recognizes this issue that we deal with. He says, I have said in John, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And finally, Paul counsels us in Romans, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and constant in prayer. So the Bible doesn't tell us why. It's one of those mysteries as to why bad things happen. We do a lot of it to ourselves, but there are those things that just happen. And, and we don't know why. And that's where UMCOR comes in. UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, that's the humanitarian relief and development arm of United Methodist Church that enables local churches to become involved in the global ministry to those in need, to all those jobs out there, to all of us who sooner or later are going to be in need. And they work in the areas of, of disaster response and health and sustainable agriculture, food security, clean water, and many more. In 2021, UMCOR provided a caring presence and aid for people impacted by severe weather earthquakes, volcanoes, by COVID-19 and its effects, by political unrest and armed conflicts, from Haiti to Afghanistan, and now unfortunately Ukraine. It's UMCOR is there to help those in need. In the U.S., UMCOR has worked to provide relief to those affected by Hurricanes Fred and Henri and 
especially at night up here. And there'll be more hurricanes in the future. In the western part of our country, there were a lot of devastating wildfires that impacted a large number of people. Suncor was there providing assistance. They're there in Texas in the upper Midwest where severe flooding occurred. And closer to home, UMCOR was there in Newman, Georgia, when they suffered an EF4 tornado last year, one year ago last Saturday. UMCOR only has a few paid staff. And they, they depend mainly on that effort is, is through UMC members like you and me in partnership with other organizations that help multiply our giving and our going and our serving. How can you be part of the problem? Giving is now a bill. This Sunday and next Sunday is an opportunity to, to make an offering to UNCOR. And 100% of these donations go to these re relief efforts. It doesn't go to be a splash in the empty bucket of crap. Um, you can volunteer. Um, there are disaster response teams sponsored by local churches. I mean, I, t I take part in that, and it's not for everybody, but it, those opportunities are there. You can get training that, that's involved in that. Uh, we have responded in the last several years to tornadoes and hurricanes in Louisiana, Florida, and Georgia. Tornadoes in Noonan and Talbot County in Lee County, Alabama. We've responded to flooding in North Carolina in the Lumberton area. Judy smiling because she was there and she helped. UMCOR has a, a warehouse they maintain in East Point. Um, preparedness is one of the one of the tenets of UMCOR. Be ready for the disaster before it occurs. So there's a warehouse that is stocked with um, relief kits and supplies that are in needed, and there are opportunities to serve there. And, and finally, and probably the most important way to be a part of UMCOR is through your prayer. Pray for those who have suffered the disaster. Pray for those who are going to aid those in need. Because it truly is a mission. Every time you go, it's, it's not the number of trees that you clear or the number of houses that you part. It's the individual people whose lives you interact with. You are there representing Christ for them. And every time I've ever gone, it's been a, an opportunity to, to minister to those people who many of them are feeling hopeless and lost, just like Job felt. And they don't know where to turn. And for that person or that family that you're working with, you are God's arm. You're his feet. You are his presence there. So prayer is probably the most needed thing, along with your dollar, along with your time. It won't do any good without prayer undergirding it all. So consider that this Sunday and next when you get an opportunity to make a donation. Keep UNCOR and those that they serve in your prayers. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. And please do consider uh, supporting this great mission uh, that we have through the United Methodist Church and Global Ministries called UNCOR. And now we will have our offering. If the ushers would come up, please. And let us pray. Generous Father, Thank you that all things were created through you and for you 
You are before all things, and in you all things exist. The Bible says that we should bring our tithes and offerings into your storehouse, and that you will respond by opening the windows of heaven and sending down blessing upon blessing. Accept the gifts we place before you now. May the peace of God reign in our lives, the love of God surround us, the Spirit of God empower us, and the joy of God uphold us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today with open hearts, open minds, and open souls. We come to you with gratitude for everything you have given us. During this season of Lent, we ask that you guide us to your will. We ask for strength to carry on, strength to avoid temptations, strength to follow you, to be humble, kind, and forgiving. We know that you are our maker, our redeemer, our help and comfort, our trust and hope. All praise go to you, Lord. Lord, we lift up to you, Zor Church. We pray that Zor will be a strong, vital church in our community. We want to be used by you to make a difference in the lives of others. We ask that you help us spread hope, love, compassion, and acceptance through the ministries at Zor. For those among us who are sick and suffering, we ask that you would touch them with your healing and with your peace. We do pray for peace, Lord, both in our country and across the world. We pray that all people who have taken up arms will lay, will lay them down and that you will help them understand that violence and war are not the answer and that differences need to be settled in a peaceful way. Lord, we ask that in the confusion of our world, you help us take time to listen to you and that we take the time to understand what you would have us do and how you would have us serve you, that we take the time to focus on you, Lord. Help us to understand the most important thing in our lives, Lord, is our relationship with you. 
Help us to ponder all of these things in our hearts as we pray your prayer. And please, please pray along with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise to you.
Thank you, praise team. Make sure this is not going to be too loud. I want to start out uh, today with a reading from 1 Peter chapter 4, 10 and 11. And Tina has put that in your bulletins today, I believe, so you can read along. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another in whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. So Pastor Greer um, had to be away this weekend, and he asked me to speak. And when he asked me, I, I thought about this, and somehow my mind went back years ago, and you have to understand how my mind works, went back years ago to the University of Georgia. So when I was enrolled in the UGA School of Education, one of the things, and you're saying, School of Education, I thought he was a pharmacist. Well, I spent a lot of time at UGA, let's just put it that way. <laughs> so when I was, I was enrolled in the School of Education, one of the things that we learned when you do a lesson plan is that you list at the very beginning of the lesson what the lesson's objectives are. In other words, what will be the various topics covered and what should the student be learning? You set the expectations at the very beginning. Well, this is kind of what I want to do. First, I want to look at this idea of being called to service and to leadership as Christians and what that call might look like. I want to look at how God prepares us for service. I want to look at the idea of how we listen to God and one or two ways we might do that. I want to look at how God intervenes in our lives and how we need to get out of our comfort zones. And while I'm up here, I might as well make this somewhat personal and use a couple of examples from my own life. Now, don't break out the popcorn. This is not going to be a movie of my life. Okay? Uh, just throwing out a couple of things. And as we go along, maybe you can think of some examples in your own lives, uh, things that have happened in the past that, you know, you say, you have this aha moment. You say, well, that kind of makes sense. When Shante was up here last week, she talked about a servant's heart. And by the way, she did a great job. And we, we really appreciate her. And it's been a truly a, a blessing to work with her and her organization over the past year or so. But she talked about a servant's heart and what that might look like and how you might acquire that heart with God's help. Well, we're going to go back backwards a little bit because you have to receive the call first. You have to figure out just what God wants you to do first and be receptive to that calling and then work on the servant's heart part of that. So a little story, a true story, as Bill Kennedy would say. We'll go back to the university. Now, when I was applying to the University of Georgia School of Pharmacy, um, I found out that there were certain prerequisite courses that you had to take to get in. Now, at the time of application, I had already taken most of these. There was a lot of chemistry, biology, math. But there was one prerequisite course that seemed kind of strange to me. We had to take a speech class. Now, at the time, I thought to myself, well, this sounds rather dumb, because I knew what a pharmacist's job would entail. We would be dispensing medications to people from behind the counter, counseling people, but not necessarily getting up in front of a group of people to speak. Well, I took the course. I did learn some things about public speaking, so it was helpful. But I never thought I would really use it. Well, I got through pharmacy school, got licensed, and went to work. Well, lo and behold, working uh, after working for a while, there did 
come about opportunities where I would have to get up in front of a group of people and speak. So I guess the staff at the UGA School of Pharmacy, they were pretty smart after all when they required that speech class. But here's the thing, I never would have thought that in the future I would be standing in, the, in front of a congregation and speaking. And in fact, the very thought probably would have terrified me. I believe that there are lessons to be learned in almost everything that happens to us. Now, taking a speech class might not seem to be that big a thing, but little things can add up to bigger things. And when I did start speaking in front of groups, I, I thought back to that class, and I concluded this, that God prepares us for the future. God used that speech class as one way to prepare me to use my voice, both professionally and at church. I had no idea at the time what was happening. I had no idea that somehow God might be preparing me for the future. But I believe that God works that way much of the time. I believe that we can think of our lives as sort of a jigsaw puzzle with a lot of pieces that fit together eventually. You don't know how they will all fit until the end, but God does. He knows. We don't know what the future will bring us. There are no crystal balls, but God does know. You know, there are several attributes that we traditionally ascribe to God, and one of those is omniscience. It comes from two Latin roots, omnis, which means all, and scientia, which means knowledge, all knowledge. God has perfect and complete knowledge of the past, present, and the future. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that he determines in advance everything that will happen to us, similar to a puppeteer controlling every move of the puppet. Although that might be a point of theological debate, we won't go there today. There is this pesky little thing called free will. And we'll circle back to that around back to that in a moment. But to summarize this point, God prepares us. We don't always know at the time what for. Next point, God can be somewhat subtle. And I would submit that God is maybe subtle almost all the time with us. Not everyone will have a huge called up to serve God experience as the Apostle Paul did with the blinding light in the, in the booming voice. It's a much quieter thing that happens. So we have to listen carefully. God is not going to shout it out to us. He, he may instead, or it may instead come in the form of a whisper. Know a little story for you, for you. Again, a true story. Years ago, when my son was in the Boy Scout troop that met here at Zor, Troop 568, and by the way, it was a great troop, had a lot of boys pass through that troop, lots of Eagle Scouts, including my son, lots of camp outs. I found out at a camp out that the current troop committee chair was leaving that position. Now, for those of you familiar with Boy Scouts, you know that the troop committee chair was the one basically in charge of the adult leadership and adult training in the troop, including the scoutmaster. The scoutmaster was in charge of the boys. Now, I knew that it could be a tough job compared with the scoutmaster's job. I mean, the boys are fairly easy to deal with, really. The adults, well, that was a different story. On that camp out, as soon as I found out about the job opening, and bear in mind this was a volunteer position, I sat down and quietly thought about it for about two minutes. Went over to the other adult leaders and said, I'll take the job. I'll be the troop committee chair. Didn't need to think about it for days on end. Didn't really pray about it. Didn't go home and discuss it with my wife. And guys, I really would not recommend that you do that as a general practice. <laughs> It could, it could get you in trouble. I just said, I'll do it. It was the first real leadership position I ever held as an adult, apart 
from my profession. I held it for four years. But since then, I've often thought about what led me to accept that position so, so readily and without thinking about it a whole lot. I really didn't have an answer. But I came to realize later on that there was something at play here, especially after accepting leadership roles in the church, like the SBR chair. And what was involved here is that God had a hand in it. He was the big influencer in that particular decision. I didn't realize it at the time, but now I know it wasn't all me. God has a plan for all of us, every one of us. He calls us to do certain things, and most of the time, he is not going to beat us over the head with it. We can be subtle about it. In my example, I guess I was at the point where I was ready to accept a volunteer leadership position and was receptive to it. I wanted the troop to keep on thriving and my son to achieve Eagle Scout. But it wasn't all my decision. God stepped in. He knew I was ready. He wanted me to lead and do the best I could with it and to maybe prepare me for other things down the road such as church leadership. Didn't understand it all at the time. Time tends to increase your understanding, I have found. We don't always know what's happening. We don't always know that just maybe it's God helping to direct your decisions. Well, let's go back to free will. Now, it seems that the current accepted theological approach is that Man and woman have God-given free will. I believe that free will is not that God created man and completely left him up to his own devices and left him to make his or own decisions. Quite frankly, if God had done that, we would probably have blown ourselves off the planet by now. But for what free will does mean is that God does intervene, and he prepares us to receive him. He encourages us and protects us from time to time. He will take care of us and not let us go off the deep end. Unfortunately, free will also means that we can choose not to listen to him at times, and there are countless examples of that in the Bible. And we can perhaps come up with examples in our own lives. When he calls you, you might miss it. You might miss it because you haven't slowed yourself down enough to listen, or you're just too distracted. You know, distractions are a big problem in our society. I want to throw out a little factoid to you. In the year 2018, over 2,800 people were killed and an estimated 400,000 were injured in car crashes involving a distracted driver. About one in five of those deaths were people not even in vehicles. They were just out taking a walk or riding a bicycle. We have to pay more attention. Distractions can lead to serious consequences. It's very easy to become distracted in this day and time with all the social media, the rampant political rhetoric that we have in this country. And I am particularly concerned about our young people spending so much time on social platforms. I'm afraid that a lot of people are just not listening and are not attuned to what God is trying to tell us. We're just too busy and too distracted. You know, I think I've got it figured out. Here's my mind working again. I think I know why. God sent Jesus to the place where he did at the time that he did. We know why he sent Jesus, but I'm talking time and place. You know, 2,000 years ago, it was a much different time. People didn't have all the distractions that they do today. No cell phones, no TV, no computers, no movies, no social media, no 24-hour news cycle, no cars. For entertainment, I suspect that they went out at night and looked at the stars and planets. And I'm sure that that was a magnificent sight. In fact, they learned a lot about the stars back then. They didn't have a whole lot. Most people were poor. 
And in the era of the world where Jesus was born and lived what we call the Holy Land now, from what I know about it, it's mostly a desert. And if it's like the desert of the American Southwest, there ain't a whole lot there. Not much of vegetation, a lot of rock, a lot of sand. So they didn't even have a lot in terms of their environment. But what did they have? Well, basically, they had God and they had each other. And that's it. I believe that God decided that that was the right time to send his son because he knew the people would be receptive without all of the distractions. And they were receptive. Not all of them, but enough of them to go out and change the world. We have to be receptive today. Compared with 2,000 years ago, however, it's a much greater challenge. You know, Satan, he loves to throw off obstacles you know, in, in our way. And one of the biggest ob obstacles is all the aforementioned distractions that we talked about. But another obstacle is fear. Fear of failure. Fear of not being adequate enough to carry on God's work. You know that fear is one of the main tools that Satan has in his tool belt. Let me tell you what fear really is. Fear is Satan's way of separating us from the knowledge that God is with us. And let me repeat that. Fear is Satan's way of separating us from the knowledge that God is with us, that God encourages us, and that God helps us in our decisions. Don't let him use fear against you. You know, it's interesting that the first thing the angel said in the second chapter of Luke in announcing Jesus' birth is fear not, fear not. You know, God really doesn't care about what your capabilities are. He doesn't care how educated you are. He doesn't care how much money you have. You know the old saying, God doesn't choose the able, but he enables the chosen. And I know that may sound rather cliche, but it's true. You know, it's a funny thing. When Jesus chose his disciples, he never had any of them fill out an application. Didn't ask for references. Didn't even get a background check. Imagine that. And these disciples are men who would eventually go out and change the world. Jesus never asked them any questions. Instead, he just said, follow me. God has a plan for everyone, every single one of us. He calls us all to Christian service in one way or another. And at some level, he calls us to be leaders, to lead maybe a group of people or to lead maybe just one person. That's okay, too. I believe that he wants us to step out of our box and out of our comfort zone. You know that comfort zone, it's a nice cozy place to be and we don't really want to get out of it. But if the kingdom on earth is to move forward, we as individuals have to get out of our own space. We just cannot keep on doing the same old things in the Christian church today. The world is changing too quickly. It doesn't mean that basic Christian principles change. They don't, but it does mean we have to find new ways to apply them. We have to get out of our comfort zone. In 2007, the Pew Research Center started doing, doing surveys concerning religion in America. Now listen carefully to this. The results were disturbing. Surveys were sent out to the adult population there were questions about religious preferences. The last survey was completed in 2021. It was found in that survey that 63% of American adults identified themselves as Christian. And that was down from 78% in 2007. It was also found that 29% of adults, 29% identified themselves as either atheist agnostic, or just nothing at all. And that was an increase of 23 percentage points from 2007. But what might be even more disturbing was a survey done in 2020 by another research firm 
which targeted adults ages 18 to 29. In that group, it was found that 36% of those adults identified themselves as being religiously unaffiliated. And I would probably guess that most of those people would also identify themselves as being atheist or agnostic. And that was up from 10% in 1986. We, as members of the Christian Church in America, simply have to do a better job in reaching these people, or we will lose an entire generation. As a church, we have to get out of the four walls that surround us and find new ways to reach people where they are. In some ways, I know I'm preaching to the choir. If all churches were involved in the kinds of ministries that Zor is involved with, we would be in a lot better shape. But we must continue to do God's work. And at the end of our lives, perhaps we will be able to say what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. But first, we as individuals must listen to God and recognize what he is really telling us as far as what our true purpose should be. In Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, he says this, the purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It is far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and aspirations. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. So I hope all this has made sense to you today and that you will take away several things. First, that God prepares us. He has a plan. We don't always know his plan right away, but we find out. He does intervene in our lives. He does speak to us again and again. We must always take time to listen and to be receptive. Listen very carefully because it may only be a whisper. And by the way, it's never too late. We're never too old. God calls us every day throughout all of our lives. There's always more that God needs us to do. So we should never give up. Second, we must overcome our fear. With God's help, we can do this. And third, we must step out of our box and step out of our comfort zone. So I want you to do something as soon as you can. Actually, I think a lot of you, and I've known a bunch of you for 40 years or more, a lot of you probably do this already, but find a quiet spot. Turn off your cell phone. I bet you probably haven't done that in a while. I bet some people don't even know that these devices actually have an off switch. <laughs> did, you, did you know that? Go find a nice path through a quiet patch of woods. Go sit beside a lake. Go to the mountains. It's only an hour and a half away. Go to the beach. Not a beach with a thousand beach umbrellas, but a quiet beach. And just listen. Listen to God. You might be surprised at what you hear. I want to close with a quote from Mother Teresa. She says, God speaks in the silence of the heart. Thank you. And now, our praise band.
before we dismiss today, I want to ask you a question. What did you learn today? Listen, Judy, what did you learn today? Okay. Listen to God. No distractions. Get out of her space. God has a plan. I like that one. Well, that could be up for debate. Well, you did listen. That's Turn great. That was, that, hey, that was, that was I the learned that there's a power switch on my phone today. That's what yeah, I learned. That, that's, that, that's right. Yeah. It's, uh, let's see. It's like right up here. Yeah. yeah Thanks. So, Thanks. Yeah. So that, that may be the most important thing that we've learned. So I thank you for being here and uh, praise band. Take it away.